Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining Learn Kubernetes with Google um, on Google Open Source Live. If you haven't attended um, a Learn Kubernetes with Google Live before, it's a series where we try and explore different topics within the Kubernetes project and the greater ecosystem. And today, of course, is all about high performance computing. Uh, my name is Bob Killen. I'm a program manager here at Google and probably a little bit more relevant to this. I am also a member of the Kubernetes Steering Committee and co-chair of Kubernetes SIG Contributor Experience. I am joined today by some panelists from Red Hat, CERN, VMware, and we have you know, a topic, high performance computing is sort of like near and dear to my heart. Um, I've been involved in HPC for quite a few years now, and I'm happy to see it becoming much more of a thing on Kubernetes. Um, just a few little housekeeping things to get out of the way quick. Uh, please don't forget to put any questions you have in the live Q&A forum down below. And we'll get to it like when um, we're, we're sort of like done with the general Q&A uh, to start with. Uh, the other thing is if you can, uh, don't forget to use the hashtag learn careers with Google to share your experience on social media. Uh, with that, let's meet all our, our panelists. Awesome. Now, I am a fan of getting a little bit of feedback. Uh, I am a fan of the the hot potato game. Uh, if you've been to one of these before, you've probably seen this before. I'll call on one person to do a little intro for themselves, and then please call the next person. Next person. Uh, let's start with uh, Mache with a J. <laughs> Okay, so that I guess that will be me. So my name is Mache. I'm working for Red Hat, and my primary areas are in SIG apps in Kubernetes and SIG CLI. And Aldo pulled me in into work group batch, so that's how I landed over here as well. And I'll pass over to Danielle. Hey. Uh, so I'm Danielle, and I work on Kubernetes at VMware. Uh, right now, I mostly work on Signode um, and a little bit of etcd, uh, but I'm also one of the co-leads for Working Group Batch as one of the Signode representatives. And I will pass things on to Aldo. Hi, my name is Aldo Wokikonder. I am a software engineer at Google. Um, I've been involved in SIG scheduling for a while. And more recently, I started contributing to SIG, SIG apps. And as a result of that, uh, I'm one of the members that um, started the discussion about starting a working group batch, which ooh, I suppose we're going to talk about a bit more later. Uh, I want to share some personal stuff too. Uh, I'm from Peru and uh, I love climbing when I'm not doing coding. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll pass it to Ricardo. All right, thanks Aldo. So my name is Ricardo, I'm a computer engineer at CERN IT in Geneva in Switzerland. Um, I work in the area of uh, containerized deployments, Kubernetes, uh, networking, and uh, more recently machine learning. Um, and uh, we are CNCF uh, end users, so we are actually end users of Kubernetes uh, above, above everything. Um, I also have a couple of roles within the ecosystem. So in the CNCF, I'm a member of the Technical Oversight Committee, uh, and I've been chair for KubeCon Europe and also the next one, North America. And the one that I would like to highlight here, which is also uh, something that Bob is very familiar with, which is the CNCF uh, research user group. So we run a dedicated user group for research uh, use cases that covers a lot of what we will talk about. And this was actually created by Bob after KubeCon Barcelona in 2019. And uh, it's, we've, we've been keeping it running since then. And I will pass to Maciek. Yeah, I'm the only one left. So Another uh, Maciek uh, here, my name is Maciek Kuzaski. I'm also, uh, I'm working together with Aldo and Bob at Google. I'm a product manager 
um, responsible for um, user requirements analysis and setting our roadmap for batch and high performance computing um, capabilities. Um, before, I used to work also on Kubernetes, but only scalability and performance uh, characteristics. And um, actually, as we worked on that, we, we realized that um batch and high performance use cases are also the ones that are running on the largest clusters so from that i essentially transitioned to, to expanding more capabilities for figuring out how to make life easier for high performance computing and batch batch folks on, on the platforms cool thank you everyone and to sort of kick it off let's just address the sort of elephant in the room uh why has hpc and batch been so hard to do on top of kubernetes I can probably start with the batch bit because I was involved since almost the early days when I was recently going through how we went from cron jobs or at the time it was called suspended jobs and how I found that Jeff and Bob actually opened one of the, the very first issues about batch. Um, I think the majority of the focus around Kubernetes initially was about running long-lived uh, long applications like deployments and all that. So that was the primary focus where everyone just jumped in and focused on that. Uh, I would say that I was joining the lower ranks uh, and started picking up the topics about jobs schedule of jobs at the time, trying to push the idea of the batch workloads overall in general to Kubernetes. And even still, uh, the fact that over time, the primary focus was on the long running uh, workloads. A lot of uh, the batch was mostly left behind. And I can speak that as someone who was working in, in controller area for currently almost seven years, uh, there was always a lot of push towards improving, adding additional workload controllers, whereas batch was always, oh, we will deal with that later. We will deal with that later up to the point where we had to move and promote cron jobs because it was in danger um, a couple years back, um, Kubernetes or specifically the architecture group introduced a cap or Kubernetes enhancement proposal, which will re start removing APIs that do not promote to GA. So CronJob was one of those that was in so-called perma beta state. And we pick up the work. There was a lot of um, rewriting in the process, uh, but we managed to push this forward and just recently, Aldo and the workgroup batch uh, kicked in, and they're pushing a lot of the initiatives that I wrote down over the time when we were working on both jobs and cron jobs, such as suspension, such as index jobs, such as other features that we will be talking throughout uh, the rest of the call. I, I want to add that even I think in, in the early days when we were talking about jobs and cron jobs, even the focus of those was more towards supporting uh, applications. So cron jobs would be used for backups, uh, not necessarily for, for running high performance computing or machine learning. Um, so the support for um, parallelism was limited and, and things like that. And, uh, I guess, uh, yes, since since Batch, uh, sorry, since Kubernetes was developing uh, towards services, and it's been already quite a few years since Kubernetes was first released, in during that time and even before Kubernetes, there, uh, there have been uh, multiple systems that researchers are already used to. Uh, I'm thinking of Slurm, HT Condor, they, they all have their features and uh, um, in a in a sense, Kubernetes is playing catch up uh, in 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 the batch world. But I would add that despite the the fact that uh, we as a community, I think, as as Maciej and Aldo said, we, we did not prioritize the work on on batch support. There there has still been 
through uh, quite significant interest from users. And um, uh, it is actually quite a big part of what we see in terms of uh, usage of Kubernetes that people run run batch workloads. I think we'll talk a little bit more in terms of types of use cases later, but like even companies that run, they started to run first <clears throat> Um, uh, microservices and uh, long-running applications on Kubernetes, they also have needs around, especially like machine learning and other types of workloads that involve batch data processing. So, so very quickly, um, very quickly, we we start to see quite significant usage. Um, so, so despite that it has been cumbersome, we we are addressing mo m most of. Uh, hopefully, we, we, Kubernetes will be the best place to run batch and high-performance computing very soon, if for some use cases it's not already. Um, and the gaps and any shortcomings, that's something that is indeed the focus of the batch working groups that will like to address all of these and and uh, and um, and make batch a first-class citizen on, on the platform, on the on the product. Yeah, well, I can I can build on that and just add some additional end user uh, view to that. I think the job API and limitations there, uh, plus the scheduling and the lack of things like pair share, uh, kind of have. It doesn't mean that people are not using Kubernetes, but they are not using just Kubernetes. They might be deploying HD Conda using Kubernetes, for example, but still using the queuing from HD Conda. Uh, the other part that is actually there are a couple of other things. Uh, that uh, Maciek mentioned, which is uh, focusing on long running uh, services, means that the traditional uh, batch where you might have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of jobs coming and going, a lot of them with very different workloads and very different images. This puts a very different kind of uh, load on the scheduler, but also on the container registries you're relying on, on the network just to pull those images. And uh, these are work like, the traditional physicist, but I would say batch user is not the best example of layering container images the best way. So you might end up pulling like uh, gigabytes of images every time for every single job on every node. Yeah, I've seen 30 gig images out there before. <laughs> yeah, our, like... our standard one is 18, I would say. So it's not far. Especially when uh, containerization first started being a thing and you had everyone, you know, taking the like 10 year old VM image and turning that into a container. And you'd end up with, you know, 200 gig container images that would then be the base of someone's infrastructure. Like the more you do of that, the more, not even just at a scheduling level, but like individual nodes you're scheduling jobs to, like they can't keep up. Yes, yeah, so there are some really interesting activities for lazy pulling of container images and things like this that are helping as well. Yes, it's Stargazer or whatever, the Google project that will lazily pull stuff in looked pretty interesting. You know, there's a, a couple other things in the CNCF that sort of have done something somewhere before, like I believe uh, Dragonfly does some of the like cross node, like image caching and propagation. Um, but yeah, that, that will, Stargazing some of those things will definitely solve a, a nice big pain point that many users have experienced. From my own personal experience, it's it's not just, I'll say like, why HPC and, and Batch are very hard to do on Kubernetes, but it's also just like a very large paradigm shift for a lot of researchers. Uh, a lot of them, it's like, I'm gonna be running my script on some, you know, I'm gonna sit like an MPI job and now it's, you know, potentially a service and some YAML and some other things. So it's just been, um, in addition to all the technical complications, there's also been sort of a, you know, culture shift uh, that, that's been going along with it. Now, with, with that, another question for everyone is, we're talking about some of the challenges, what are some of the advantages that you see that Kubernetes could bring to HPC and Batch? I'll happily start again. <laughs> um, I think we covered some of the areas. Daniel mentioned uh, solutions for pre-pooling, so all the tools that actually were built to support even long running applications, uh, filtering all the RBAC, entire ecosystem that is built around Kubernetes, not only within the core, but around Kubernetes, that makes, um, I don't know, using different network providers, different storage providers, uh, the fact that the, 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 
entire Kubernetes ecosystem is so broad and it is covering pretty much a lot of the um, devices, whatever you can think of outside of just the cube core is a big benefit because uh, there's a pretty high chance that whatever uh, thing you're using currently, it might be 99% of cases covered already by either cube core or one of the extensions that exist. And then all the reliability that are built into the Kubernetes are a perfect building block. So that basically goes down to, to the initials when and why Kubernetes uh, came to be. Yeah, like I sometimes talk about this in terms of like Lego, uh, because now throughout like the CNCF and various other projects, we've built a lot of the building blocks that if you now wanted to build a HPC platform, you don't need to go and spend like, you know, a year going and doing research and like prototyping stuff and like building stuff and trying to get grant money. Like you can take some stuff mostly off the shelf and get going. Won't be perfect yet, but like it'll get you somewhere. I would add that uh, the also the characteristics of Kubernetes that are also relevant for long running applications apply here. So the fact that it's an open source standard, it's um, so a application is portable. You can move it anywhere. And like batch and HPC use cases have a lot of uh, uh, processing volume uh, where um, it, it's a good candidate for like being sent as an overflow capacity, for example, to a cloud provider, frame or on premises, HPC farms. So like, like there's always more uh, scientific computations to be done on, on in a in a in a university so research institutions data center that we can handle. And the cloud providers then then actually like take over that as an overflow host, or as actually the fact that you have managed Kubernetes services across all of the clouds is also uh, a, a major advantage um, of of the ecosystem because like you can just set up your platform without worrying uh, about lots of stuff like observability, uh, just um, machines provisioning, etc. Uh, you get easy access to the latest uh, accelerators. Uh, and such stuff so and then the ecosystem is also like it's a very lively open source community um that's building just lots of stuff everywhere so it, it's really it, it it's really it's just a cool place to be and uh, work with cool people also on developing these things yeah, maybe maybe i'll just build on that and, ex and, and uh, stress it more which is uh the, the, the fact that you start being part of uh, a large community is a big plus. And also, even if you're just doing this internally, like the consolidation, if you already transition some of your services to Kubernetes and you have teams that know how to handle this, doing the consolidation also for the larger batch farms can also be a plus. That can be also motivation. And then, the, uh, as Maciek mentioned, uh, uh, reaching uh, like getting access to additional resources that you might not have in-house, things like uh, uh, GPUs or not in large numbers and being able to go and, and, and burst to, to public clouds with managed Kubernetes without having to handle the infrastructure as well. Uh, and even things that you might never have like TPUs or uh, I don't know, um, um, other types of, uh, of accelerators. I think that there's also um, a motivation from, from improving the status quo in HPC farms uh, in, in other areas as well. All the tooling around uh, security checks and, and like runtime uh, checks, uh, tools like Falco or, or all the OPA policies standardizing on this. I think the HPC farms could also benefit in this area of it. I can say, oh, so go for Aldo. Yeah, I just want to add that also organizations uh, already have strong infrastructure teams uh, that know how to run Kubernetes. And uh, once once you want to add batch, uh, they already have you know all this knowledge, so they they can build on it. Um, that's that's a, a a huge benefit. And also, if maybe if you have a um, fixed size cluster where you're already running your own running applications. And then sometimes there is low demand, and so you have the capacity 
you could be using that capacity to to run batch workloads um, and it's simpler if you have the same the same infrastructure yeah one more comment on that like especially these days where grants can actually come with like cloud credits and it's great being able to you know I can use my my local HPC, and then if I happen to get a grant for you know a specific cloud provider, I just need to know Kubernetes. I don't necessarily have to you know learn how to interact with Amazon or you know Google or any of the other cloud providers out there. I just have to know enough to provision a Kubernetes cluster, and then I get then I can start spinning stuff up. It's I have personally seen a large value add in, in that from uh, wearing a previous hat at the University of Michigan. So on to the, the next sort of question. Um, this is more for Aldo, Mache, and Danielle. Um, in February of this year, Kubernetes Steering approved the batch working group. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the batch working group already, but can you give us a little TLDR on what it is and sort of what you're working on right now? Maybe first, uh, it's important to distinguish a working group from a SIG. Um, the, um, the, the nature of a working group is, is uh, to discuss and to propose, as opposed to a SIG, which uh, also has the, man the mandate to maintain uh, certain uh, certain set of uh, applications. Um, so th that's the nature as well of the working group batch. Uh, we are a forum where where different uh, organizations, different communities, uh, us as SIG uh, leads can discuss uh, all topics about batch. And then we can propose enhancements to the respective SIGs in Kubernetes. Of course, a lot of us are also members of SIGs. So we likely will, would be the ones uh, also doing the implementation and reviews and whatnot. Um, but, but that's nature, uh, propose, discussing and proposing. Um, and we currently have a few, a few discussions that are going on. I don't know. If um, any of the others want to expand on that? Yeah, I can add to that because like Aldo mentioned, each of us represents different special interest groups. Uh, I mentioned that I'm uh, representing uh, the apps, which is basically all the controllers. Aldo mentioned that he's representing scheduling, whereas Danielle was representing the node team. Those three uh, special interest groups are basically the primary ones that are, are affected by the changes coming from the uh, from the batch working group. So what we're currently focusing on is we are inviting everyone. So if you have a topic for the worker batch, you have a particular use case that you are either having a handwritten solution or you are struggling to combine uh, different um building blocks uh, to put together to run a particular HPC workload, we invite you to join our bi-weekly calls, present your ideas. Um, last, Just last week, uh, there was a discussion about controllers that we don't support pausing uh, workloads controllers for some use cases. I can't remember uh, the presenter name uh, Diane or probably something like that. She was basically discussing that, oh, it would be pretty cool if we could also pause uh, daemon set, deployment set, stateful sets, because we just recently added su such functionality over to jobs. And um, of course, we already have the pause uh, ability in deployments, but we're missing that functionality in the other controllers. So pointing out the missing bits uh, very often those missing bits, which are present in one controllers, but are not in the others, is very simple addition. Um, the fact that we have those differences between controllers is coming from the fact that they were written at different point in time by different people. And um, 
one of my goals for SIG apps over the next couple of uh, months and years is unifying uh, certain areas uh, for uh, running the controllers or building uh, stuff on top of the current controllers. Currently, uh, the pausing is one example. A different example would be if you would like to build on top of the existing controllers, it is very hard to do it because each controller has different rules for running and it will report whether it's running or not or it's struggling or it's progressing or it's updating or whatever in very different ways because they were written by different people at different point in time so one of the goals that we have we're slowly working towards is unifying the conditions across different controllers this way if you will be building something on top of kubernetes you could easily uh, reuse the controllers and switch from, I don't know, deployment to daemon sets just because the API will be there to be able to do so. We're not there, of course. Uh, it'll take some time. But the worker batch is a perfect place for you to come. Uh, tell us about your pain points. And we are more than happy to listen to them um, and build on top of that with further changes. I want to clarify that we have identified uh, three high-level uh, work streams or topics that uh, we were discussing. So one of them is uh, job management, or uh, sorry, or work uh, job API, which can be expanded to workload workloads APIs. Uh, so that's one topic. Uh, another topic is job management, uh, which is when you have way too many jobs. Now you have to think about uh, starting one after the other, satisfying fair sharing uh, between multiple tenants and whatnot. So that's another topic. And a third topic is uh, more closely related to SIG node, um, which is uh, enhancing support uh, for different hardware, um, specialized hardware, which is maybe less common in, in, in services and application, in long running applications. But in HPC, you want all this these workloads, uh, sorry, all these uh, different hardwares to to make things uh, faster. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe Danielle, can can you expand on this? Uh, I was mildly distracted by the cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think Aldo, you're gonna have to pay the cat tax now. Yeah, I mean, you, you, need, you need to bring him in, I think. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, ADHD brain and cat noises. <laughs> that, um, my brain just pushed. Um, what did Aldo want me to expand on? One of the streams that we're uh, discussing, uh, he discussed three of them. The one about uh, specifically Node was the one where uh, he asked you to build uh, a little ah, bit more. Okay. Uh, so there's a bunch of work going on in Node right now around like sort of two specific areas. The one that overlaps most with what we're doing in Batch is the work around support for devices and supporting like random other bits of hardware that's fairly common in sort of HPC scenarios. Um, and so like there's a couple of interesting caps right now around having sort of like network attached devices and bringing those into the kubelet. Um, which like when you start considering like where smart NICs are going means you can, you know, have a box of GPUs somewhere in your data center that you can then attach to like arbitrary workloads and stuff. Um, which is pretty cool. Like, pretty excited for that. Also, I've been, I've been pretty excited about a lot of the initiatives in that, that have been started in, in the batch working group. Um, moving on real quick. Now, batch isn't just a thing that's being focused on in upstream. There is actually a lot of other things going on in the greater community. Uh, Ricardo, uh, given your role in the TOC, um, what other initiatives have you seen sort of in the broader ecosystem? Right. So uh, I think that for the last couple of years, there, there's been uh, other projects that have been focusing on this and building on, on top of Kubernetes, but extending them. 
projects like Volcano have been around for quite a while. Uh, there's more recent ones, a uh, project called Armada that does like multi-cluster uh, scheduling things. And those um, have been um, kind of uncoordinated. So one of the things that also came after the Kubernetes Batch Working Group is this new uh, batch system initiative within the CNCF, which is kind of has similar goals, but it's more on the not focusing so much on the core primitives that should go on Kubernetes core, but making sure that the tooling is making use of those primitives correctly, and then extending the use cases to things like workflows or pipelines and how you um, define those on top of Kubernetes efficiently. Um, also trying to onboard some traditional batch schedulers into, into this uh, uh, ecosystem as well. So those are some of the goals in this uh, new initiative as well. And then maybe maybe not so much from, from the TOC, but also like if we look at uh, KubeCon recently, there was uh, for the first time a research track and we had a couple of talks uh, where we were trying to focus on batch use cases, um, batch and HPC use cases. And also there was a dedicated co-located event uh, for batch and HPC. So that was the first time as well. So the momentum is really um, uh, building uh, around this. There were a couple of mentions also during the keynotes and last KubeCon for, for batch workloads, not, not only for HPC, but also machine learning, AI, we already mentioned a couple of times. Yeah, HPC is kind of the default thing that people go to, but batch actually enables a whole slew of things. Um, one of the big things like I've personally seen is just like in the difference sort of between Kubernetes and everything else is Kubernetes is adding the like base functionality, like the the raw knobs that you might need that for like things that exist at higher level, like Volcano or, you know, Armada, some of these other things to sort of streamline it and make it easier. At least the, that, that's sort of been like my, my like sort of personal, like the way I viewed the so this like yeah, separation so, of priorities. <laughs> absolutely. There, there was a bit of discussion about this also during the colo at KubeCon, uh, trying to figure out what's the role of each uh, and to, to coordinate uh, in the best way the, the, the role of each of the working groups. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, interaction that will be required, but the goal is not to, to like overlap in, in the activities, it's really to, to make sure yeah. everyone is making all the core stuff should be in core and all the rest should stay in the products, but uh, they're complementary. Sort of exactly. Yeah, yep. absolutely. That's a cool. Um, question now for Machek. As a product manager, you see all sorts of requests from users. Um, so when we think of batch, we think of like scientific computing, but can you talk about some of the other use cases that batch is really enabling? Yeah. So. We all mentioned uh, machine learning in here, and I, I think when you look at uh, we, for example, as a cloud provider, would, as we look at what our users are actually running, machine learning training is probably the biggest um, type of um, um, batch workload, uh, machine learning training, and some of the, so there are also batch, batch versions of inference, um, you know, for example, running some data classification uh, models on top of the data that you have. So, so that that's very big. Um, another very big domain is uh, data processing for investment banks. Um, that's uh, the mathematical models used for uh, that they use for for um, investing decisions. They are very frequently very tolerant to disruption, so they're a very good candidate to be running on um, uh, resources types like Spot VM, which can fail at any minute, and uh, so the workload needs to be easily easy to restart. But then you get a very significant um, price discount. Uh, so, so that's that's and actually Kubernetes. One of the advantages, as we didn't mention, Kubernetes is very is a very good orchestrator that is capable of handling um, uh, VM failures. So it's very good. Uh, it's a very good orchestration framework for running uh, the, those batch workloads, which which are capable of tolerating disruptions and they need to be restarted and uh, move again. Uh, which, which there is a quite a lot of a lot of a lot of it's a quite a big domain. I would say another one is uh, geospatial um, data analysis, so like image satellite image processing, for example. That that's a very big thing. Um, uh, video rendering, um, so render farms are are actually a, also like, like huge huge projects that are uh, running batch workloads. 
Um, and we could probably name name more uh, like computer aided design or computer aided engineering using other words. So uh, you know, there's lots of lots of very interesting stuff. But, um, and but and then of course the scientific computer community, which which has been doing batch and uh, high performance computing before all of us were born, and then has a ton of experience, and that's also probably why why um, is the main main group that is associated with with, with the use case. Awesome, thank you. I I know even beyond you know what you mentioned. Um, the primitives that are, are that are talked about being potentially added to Kubernetes will certainly, and like the improvements of the job API will help all sorts of people. The the impact on the changes that are sort of coming out of this group uh, will, will definitely be far reaching. And speaking of something from the batch working group, uh, Aldo, can you tell us a little bit about Q with a K and sort of what that does, what it is and what it does for the ecosystem. Absolutely. Um, so Q is a proposal coming out of uh, SIG scheduling initially, and we we are managing the development uh, through SIG scheduling and through the working group batch uh, to gather requirements and whatnot. Um, so what, that is, what does it do? Uh, it's a simple, a kind of simple controller that manages when a job should be started or suspended. Um, maybe some of you know that uh, in the job API, we, we added uh, this suspend field some time ago, um, which basically controls whether uh, pods are created or not. So Q uh, exploits this, uh, this field to simply uh, do some job level uh, scheduling, although we don't don't like it, we don't like calling it scheduling because it's confusing. Uh, it's not a scheduler. It's it, it just it, it's a fair sharing uh, controller. Um, so you define quotas um, for for your uh, for your tenants, and then you put your workloads or jobs specifically in a queue and then the, the controller will decide when, when these jobs should start. Then it creates, uh, it starts the job, the job controller kicks in and creates the pods and then keep scheduler kicks in and schedules the pods. If they don't fit, cluster out the scheduler kicks in and creates new nodes. Um, so it, the, that, exp that, that shows the, the nature of the project. It, it's not supposed to replace any of the existing components. It's rather uh, building on top of the, the, um, the building blocks uh, to show how, how we envision uh, job queuing or uh, uh, should happen in Kubernetes. Uh, I mentioned jobs specifically uh, because that's the one that uh, well, we, we, we want uh, people to to use if possible but of course job is is not the only api so that's why Mache was mentioning what if we add suspend to other controllers uh, um, but but more generally uh, um, you know you could have a crd as well uh, because the, the kubernetes apis will all there are there will always be people who need a different api so um, as long as your API supports uh, this, this same semantic of stopping and starting, uh, there is a simple CRD that you can uh, create as well to integrate with Q. So in theory, any any CRD that supports supports these semantics can be can be supported by Q. Um, that's that's roughly the, the idea uh, of Q. Do you think Q will make it into Kubernetes core? Or is it going to stay as like a separate project? Uh, we don't know yet. Um, it's possible that some of the APIs uh, might be uh, might be useful for a wider audience. Uh, for example, the, this workload API that uh, that I just mentioned could be used for uh, for uh, cost scheduling or, or otherwise called all, all or nothing scheduling. Uh, um, but uh, 
Yes, I think the the project needs to mature uh, to to a to a better point where we can more clearly see uh, if if putting those if pushing these APIs upstream makes sense. And that's where we need the help of all all, all of the the audience here, the community, to figure out what's missing, what uh, um, and what what are the shortcomings on, on existing APIs, so that we can make a more informed decision uh, down the road. Awesome, thank you. Sort of piggybacking off a little bit what you touched at with some of the job API stuff and some of the things that have been said previously. Um, Mache, there's there have been a lot of improvements that have uh, gone into the jobs API. Can you talk to us a little bit more about some of those things? Yeah, sure. So. Um... Like we said at the beginning, jobs was kind of left behind. And when I initially started working on it, we took a couple of shortcuts. Uh, one that is most painful to especially HPC or any kind of high scale um, execution is the fact that we're leaving behind a ton of pods when you are uh, calculating how many more pods has to be created or in general if your if your job is creating i don't know 1000 10000 100000 pods to execute or do whatever calculation it is doing those this number of pods has to stick there on your cluster so that we can calculate oh we completed and then we can say yes you uh, you are free to remove them of course the, uh, the bigger the number of the pods required to run a particular job, uh, the higher the requirements on the entire cluster is to keep those pods around even when they are finished or especially when they are finished. Because in normal circumstances, uh, Kubelet garbage collector would kick in and remove those uh, that have completed and you would be keeping a rather stable uh, usage of your cluster. And... Uh, we were aware of that limitation from day one, uh, but at the time we uh, we picked the simplest approach that we could put to, uh, to the people to try to verify and then report uh, back. But even already then, we set and open an issue um, which asks for a different approach for how to calculate the pods as they are uh, being completed and then uh, so that we can uh, leave them and do not require uh, the cluster to, to have them uh, sticking around. So that's one of the stuff that has been, that will have a significant impact, especially on the HPC or any kind of large scale uh, job executions. Uh, there, there has been a couple other uh, changes and maybe Aldo can uh, speak about them, but they were around um, exposing information, how many jobs are ready, uh, the suspension that Aldo mentioned, uh, index job, which was also uh, initial, we agreed that this is something that we would want to see happen in the job API, but we didn't have the time and the resources to uh, to finish the implementation, which basically allows each of the pods in your job to have a particular index rather than, oh, we just need to run 100 pods. The index job, each pod has a particular index assigned to it. So it's more like a stateful set. Uh, it's just that it runs to a particular uh, completion. I'm not sure so, if Aldo, you want to add something. That that was one of my favorite things being added was the index job. That was a lot big pain point for me back at the university. <laughs> and and uh, once we added these features, of course, people came in with, with with new requirements, which totally makes sense. And we we are working through them. Uh, for example, just uh, this week, uh, we have been working on a proposal for uh, a retriable errors or, or even non-retriable errors. When you know your pod is completely failing due to a user mistake, software mistake, and you don't want to keep retrying. So uh, all of that um, logic or all uh, that policy is not possible to to um, to express today. So we're uh, working through that. And then 
specifically about index jobs, there are questions about what should we do if, if an index fails? Should we fail the entire job? Uh, for some people that makes sense, for some people it doesn't. You just want to fail the index and continue running the rest of the indexes. So um, yes, uh, there, there are new features, but there, there are a, a, a lot of new features coming. And again, we, we, need, uh, we need your feedback and uh, it's gonna take time uh, because that's one of the, um, the good things about Kubernetes is that it, it's reliable. So uh, because it's reliable, we have to go slow. We have to make sure our APIs uh, make sense. Uh, we have to go through the release process of you know starting as alpha, disabled by default, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna take some time, but the earlier we can start the discussions, the better. Just as one a little clarifying point, like the fastest an API can go from alpha to GA in Kubernetes is a year. Like that is the fastest, it, like you know, it can go because it has to spend a little bit of time at alpha, beta, and then you know, then graduating to GA. <laughs> uh, I would probably say a little bit more than a year because theoretically, from what I remember, most of the APIs as they go, it's alpha one release, another release for beta, and usually between beta and GA, we keep most of the APIs for two releases. So that, that is basically four releases. And with the current cadence that we are releasing three times a year, that's a little bit over a year. And I there are cases where we will speed it up, but we're, we, like Aldo mentioned, the, the reliability bar is very high at this point in time. And we would rather to delay the promotion by a release rather than rushing something in and then uh, struggle with instabilities or major issues on any particular feature. I completely agree there. Danielle? I mean, the ideal with all infrastructure software is you ship changes, and unless somebody wants to use them, nobody notices. Things just hopefully get better. Like, if I'm doing my job, you don't know my job exists. Especially in 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 the node world, where you, you don't want it to, you don't you don't want any problems there. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, speaking of node, uh, are there any initiatives that are like currently being worked on in there that are sort of batch related? Uh, yeah, the main one being um, sort of dynamic resource allocation, which is what I was alluding to earlier. Uh, so bringing in uh, resources that are off the node. Uh, and allocate in them at runtime. Uh, so, you know, you can schedule a job, land on a node, it goes, I need like these GPUs or whatever, and then it'll go and talk to either your like cloud provider control plane or, you know, your box of stuff somewhere and allocate everything to the host, uh, which will be pretty cool. Um, and aside from that, I'm mostly working on improving a lot of our testing reliability. Uh, to sort of just, you know, keep things shipping smoothly and making it a bit easier for us to learn those changes in the future. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we, we had a few more questions in the queue for the group, but for the, the sake of getting to actually being able to answer some of the user submitted questions, we'll cut those and just go right, right to questions from the audience. Uh, but, you know, thank you everyone for the great discussion we've had so far. Uh, the, the first question that is also pretty much a node-related one, do we have a roadmap for Kubernetes running in user space? Yes, there is There is a cap for running the kubelet uh, with user namespaces at least. And then after that, we can start thinking about running the kubelet as a user learned process. And I am excited. <laughs> it will make my life much better. <laughs> Do you happen to know the cap number off the top of your trying head? Trying to find okay. it. Oh, when you when you uh, if you go to github.com slash kubernetes slash enhancements and then go to like caps slash uh, sig node, there'll be a list in there. Um, they're sort of all done by number. Danielle, can you just like chime in when you find it? We'll, we'll uh, move on. It oh. is. Oh. Um, 
127? Okay. Kept 127. Wow, that's an old kept. That's a very old kept. It's taken a long time, and C groups V2 to yep. be possible. Yeah, that's definitely been a, a big, big long-term milestone. So the the next question we have is for uh, Mache. Um, during, uh, from Satish, during long-running workloads, uh, did do pods get terminated? What challenges were faced? Um. I'm not 100% sure I fully understand that question, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, so for uh, long running workloads, so that would be deployments, daemon sets, and safe for sets. Whenever a pod gets terminated, we are just replacing it. That was the, uh, the core uh, idea behind Kubernetes to always ensure that we are running this many pods of your application or this many replicas. And this applies to all the workloads controllers. So that will be deployments, daemon sets, stateful sets, where we will always replace. In case of jobs or cron jobs and generally in the batch area, uh, the situation is a little bit more tricky. Like Aldo mentioned, we are currently discussing options for retrying certain pods, when we should retry or when not. Uh, because up to this point in a regular job, a job will uh, depend on uh, how you configure your job. Either it will always say, oh, it just failed, we will replace it, or it will retry in case of the index jobs. So that will always depend on your particular configuration. If that did not answer your question, please feel free to you know expand and we can we can try and get to it at the, the end of the other questions. Um, the next question, uh, and I apologize if I uh, butcher your name, uh, Beshkar, uh asks, uh, Docker was not popular in HPC due to root access and other limitations. Uh, container uh, like singular, Singularity and others are popular. Do you think Kubernetes native support to other containers uh, has been improved? I think general you know, container runtime question. Uh, so it has. Uh, thankfully, uh, with the migration to the container runtime interface, and the removal of Docker shim, it is now much easier to plug in various container runtimes into Kubernetes. Uh, I know Scilabs had a CRI implementation for Singularity, although I'm not sure if they still support it. Um, but there are also alternatives like uh, running things inside micro VMs through like Firecracker or GVisor. Um, Kata containers. Kata, yeah. Um, that are all pretty exciting if you don't want to deal with a very specific implementation. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Samuel. Uh, current HPC systems use distributed file systems that are not supported by Kubernetes directly as a storage class, for example, Luster. Are current goals to bring HPC to Kubernetes focused on bringing all the HPC stack into the Kubernetes API? I can make one comment on the Luster side. It is actually, there is some storage classes out there that support it. I like, um, it's only under certain environments though. Um, but I know I've seen one in the Kubernetes 6 repo. <laughs> I can decide no, for, yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that in, in our case, uh, we actually have an HPC uh, cluster running with a Ceph backend. And uh, in those cases, like the um, Ceph CSI drivers are premature. So you won't have an issue there. So th there's quite a lot of HPC centers with this kind of setup. I think the CSI is is the, the key there to make sure that it's well supported. And then the discussions that will follow is do you use Fuse or Kernel? And uh, what are the different uh, pros and cons of, of that choice? I check. No, I actually just want to say like it is already possible today, and we are also looking at improving the experience uh, in in that front. So, so so it is possible, and folks are running, and uh, there is definitely more to come in that space indeed to to improve that experience on it running uh, with Luster and other similar file systems. Thank you. Uh... 
Uh, next question, also from Samuel. Uh, Kubernetes already supports multiple container implementations, but not Singularity. Will Singularity be on the roadmap for Kubernetes? Um, um, so only in terms of everything now goes through a CRI. Uh, but if somebody wanted to maintain an implementation of a CRI interface to Singularity, um, we would never actively break it. And we try to work with implementations um, through like the review process for API changes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I know that a Singularity CRI exists. Um, I've, I've seen Singularity containers running on top of Kubernetes. I just don't know the current status of it. And maybe and one that, thing to add there as well is this uh, rootless containers initiative. It's mostly, to be honest, I, I would give a shout out to Akihiro Suda, who, who is doing the full stack of going through the pain of making everything rootless, which is unbelievable, but he's doing it. Um, there, there's this web page where uh, there's a summary of where the different tools and the level of support in things like Containerd, uh, Podman, uh, BuildKit, all the tooling around not only Kubernetes, but all the ecosystem and the support for um, uh, rootless deployments. So it's, it's something to check and follow. The rate at which that work is going is also mind blowing. Like, I don't know how. <laughs> Despite, you know, seeing all the PRs, like, it's amazing. Yeah. Much love for Akihiro. <laughs> yes. Much check. You had a... No, the problem is we go to the next question. I uh, just go over the call. Oh, okay. Um, so next question. Uh, Ariel asks, what are the fault tolerance strategies, features available in Kubernetes for HPC scientific computing workloads? Or sorry, not Ariel. Uh, Anery. I guess uh, that's what we are working on this week. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, I don't have the cap number at hand. Uh, let me. But yes, um, maybe if you go through the enhancements repo and look at the issues, it's probably one of the top ones. Um, it's called retriable and non-retriable. Uh, jobs. Um, that's that's where we want to to implement uh, different strategies for, for failure tolerances. Um, although I'm not sure if I'm I'm answering the, the exact question Anna is asking. I would add to Aldo's uh, because like the what what the what Aldo indeed and the team are, are working on there is uh, the variety of retrieval exit codes for jobs. There are also um, fault tolerance strategies on different layers. For example. Um, there is work on taking uh, snapshots of containers. There is work in the ecosystem uh, to to support like uh, automated snapshotting of workloads. Um, or there is a very interesting project um, published on GitHub by Two Sigma called Fast Freeze that allows you to um, take a snapshot of the or take, take a checkpoint of the work that is the container is do, uh, performing when it's expecting, for example, a disruption from a failure of the machine, and you have a window where you can still take a, take that uh, checkpoint. So uh, there's actually quite a lot of, depending on the, uh, let's say, failure domain that you're trying to protect yourself, there will be probably two or three options in Kubernetes um, uh, to handle that. Uh, cool, thank you. Uh, that takes us to our last question from Kyle. Hi, Bob, go blue. Uh, <laughs> University of Michigan colors. Uh, currently, we are using Argo workflow to handle some simple HPC tasks under Kubernetes, like embarrassingly parallel uh, tasks uh, or Spark jobs. For physics simulations, that's more complicated and uses MPI. I'm under the impression Kubernetes does not handle this well, and people use open source resource like Kube, Open MPI, etc. Am I not up to date? Can anyone confirm? I mean, MPI is MPI is actually well handling MPI well is also about how you integrate Kubernetes with your underlying infrastructure. So there's a lot in that. In terms of the orchestration of the job, uh, there are a couple of very good solutions like MPI operator that is part of Kubeflow. Aldo is actually one of the big contributors there, uh, or, or one of the contributors. Um, uh, and uh, uh, but other than that, like uh, it, it's important you need like that you look at how your network is configured. Do you have RDMA um, support? Uh, 
compact placement in case of cloud providers uh, and other like how your CNI uh, is um, configured, uh, but like uh, it is possible to achieve very low levels of like pinpoint latencies and and good results on MPI performance benchmarks to 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 run that type that type of workloads too. It's also important to clarify that these these uh, other communities are are somewhat healthy communities with Argo, uh, Kubeflow, so. Um, we don't necessarily want to have a replacement in, in core Kubernetes for, for these features. They are kind of specialized use cases. So uh, we want to provide the building blocks so they can they can do their, their applications better. Again, back to the job API, back to queue. Um, we, we want to integrate with them uh, or we want, for example, MPI job to maybe use the job API underneath. Um, but we are not planning to have probably a, an MPI job in core Kubernetes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And we are now technically one minute over. Uh, <laughs> so we, we, we will call it there. We will we'll make that a wrap for and just say uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, this session will be available on demand uh, one week um, from today on June 22nd. Um, one big thing, if you are interested in this topic, please come to the batch working group in Upstream Kubernetes or the batch system initiative or the research user group in the CNCF. Uh, we cannot make this better for HPC and research workloads without you. So please uh, come get involved. Uh, the next little thing uh, if you can uh, please be sure to save the date for our next uh, learn with the Google session on September 22nd uh, where we will actually dive into Istio securing your services with Istio on Kubernetes um, and the, the last tiny little housekeeping thing if you can uh, please take the event survey on the right side of your screen that helps us you know sort of improve this for the future and you know you can talk about some of the topics that you might want to see on in future uh, learn Kubernetes with google live events with that uh thanks again and have a great day